as a believer priest, it's your responsibility through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 to confess sin if necessary. Could be mental attitude type, could be sins of the tongue or overt. 1 John 1 9 says, confess them, God will forgive, forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that establishes in the church age the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach you the Word of God. It's the only way you can learn it is through the Holy Spirit. You, you can't read. The Bible is not a book that can be read in the flesh and understood. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man or the man in, in, in his natural state cannot understand it. It takes the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. By the automobile and the internet, I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God about Noah's covenant as it relates to us today who live in the post-Diluvian period and in the dispensation called the church looking for the second coming of Christ, our study on Sunday, which is the rapture out of 1 Thessalonians 4. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what God has done, he's picked up the Noah's covenant that he began in the 8th chapter and is now drawing that thing into conclusions. And so we, we want to pick that, that whole idea up under the next five points. Today's lesson, looking at Noah's covenant part two. I mean, you got to read part one to get to part two, and you got to read part one, part two to get part three. <laughs> okay, so let's remember that. In part one of Noah's covenant, we studied three nevers out of the eighth chapter, verse 21, 22. Look back over there. It's the last two verses of chapter eight. Uh, after, after Noah offered the burnt offering, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, and it, listen, and he recorded what he says to himself. Isn't that interesting? Huh? The God has inner dialogue. I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for, and watch, and he tells you why. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, I will never again destroy every living thing I have, I have done. While the earth remains, seed time harvest, cold heat, summer, winter, day, night shall never cease. Then he comes back and he adds a couple more and then summarizes the never again. And I found it interesting that when he approached what he would never do again, he spoke it to himself. You know, that's omniscience talking to, uh, to sovereignty. Do you understand that? That's omniscience speaking to sovereignty. I will never again do that, right? Mm -hmm. And th that might be hard for us to kind of grasp, you know? And does he do it that way? Well, so that we as human beings who, who have inner dialogue with ourselves can understand thing that God says, I'll never do this again. It's at a, at a different level. You know, when we say I'll never do it again, the odds are we'll probably do it again. <laughs> right? Unless it was so horrendous to you experientially that you'd never do it again. I mean, the, the experience for you to never do something again, do it the first time, Unless it has burnt, it has been such a traumatic experience in your life, you're going to do it again because of old man divide, uh, cosmos diabolical thinking. You're going to do it again because of a pattern of the way you think and behave. And it takes something really dramatic in your life to say, I'll never do it again and be able to stick to it. Now, so it's kind of interesting when God says to himself, I will never do this again and speaks it out to us and records it. it. It is omniscient speaking to sovereignty, you know, what he will never do again. It's the do part that reaches from omniscience, what God's plan is, to sovereignty, what he will do. So it's just kind of interesting. I mean, I didn't write that, you know. <laughs> I didn't come up with this idea that he spoke to himself. I would have never thought that. I would have never thought that way in a million years. Just interesting because he did lay it out to me uh, or to us. It just makes an interesting idea about the intent of God 
And he uses the word intent. Notice he talks about the intent of man's heart. And what he said in Hebrew here, when he said that the intent of man's heart, and one of the keys that you got to look is the intent of man's heart towards evil that starts when he's a very young person and has to be corrected or it affects his civilization and everything he touches in it. In other words, his own territory, his own personal choices and ideas and everything he influences. And, and if you will notice, the intent of man's heart was, was evil, only evil continually. And in Hebrew, what that means is every minute, listen to me now, ev thinking evil every minute of every day. I mean, you're in a lot of trouble when you think evil. Most of us get a break in there because we can't, listen, some of us can't spend a moment on thinking in evil because it is so evil. I mean, if you have a dream and it has evil in it, you wake yourself up and go like, poof, you may have to get up, drink a cup of coffee. It will scare you to death. What? You never had one of those dreams? <laughs> With absolutely. You got to do something to get back to sleep. So it, it's just, it, and he says one of the things that you got to look for is evil, the intent from youth up, the intent where they, they are focused on every minute of every day. I mean, we're in a lot of trouble with it, aren't we? All right. Come on in. Okay. We're in a, a study on Noah's covenant. We're in the ninth chapter. And we've just started in our introduction. So we're at point one. In part one of the Noah's covenant, we're studying it in three parts. But in part one of Noah's covenant, God said to himself, I will never again do some things. Recorded in the eighth chapter, verse 21, 22. He said, for example, he said, I, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. And then he says, because... Uh, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. He said, I will never again destroy every living thing. And then in verse 22, uh, he talks about how the earth remains, seed time, harvest time. I will never, I, I, and he says, it shall never cease. So there's a three nevers that God says will never be in the post-Diluvian period. We live in the post-Diluvian period. And we live in the period after the flood. And so what is Matthew 24, 37, 39, Jesus said, of the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We live in the days of so we've gone back and what we're looking at is what are the key characteristics of that day that we should be, that warn us about our day. And, and so that's what, what that's what we're doing. And and so he's do he 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 wrote a covenant to you and I. The 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 post diluvian period has the Noahic covenant. And we're studying it in three parts. Over again, will, uh, will all flesh be cut off by the flood waters? Um, uh, or, or he said, first of all, never again will I curse the earth. Did he ever curse the earth? Yeah, Genesis third chapter, verse 17 through 19, right? What was that do? Adam's sin, right? Adam's sin. Never again will I destroy every, every living thing. You suppose he ever did it before? Something really interesting. In Genesis 1.1, it says God created the heavens and the earth. He used the word bara. That means to create something out of nothing in the Hebrew. But in verse 2, he introduces <clears throat> us to tohu wabohu. That the, that, and tohu wabohu is something bad has happened. Tohu waho, formless and darkness has covered the earth. Right? Something's happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Tohu wa bohu, tohu, tohu wa bohu is a really interesting Hebrew concept. And when you study it in the Bible, you're going to see that God has 
turned on something. Something has really changed. And here is the creation in one and two. It's now what he created in verse one is now toho wabohu without form and void and that business, darkness. And, and, and the spirit of God has to hover over it and keep that in some kind of tack. And then what happens is we have the restoration of that creation in verses three through the end of the chapter, right? Yeah. Uh, in, um, in, uh, as soon as some pastor buys this church, we'll be out in Moody. And when we get out there in, in July, we will be in the, we're, we're going to study creation story again. We're going to go through this because people don't really understand. They, they don't understand the importance of tohu wabohu in verse 2. It's a, it's a gigantic principle in Hebrew. Well, anyhow. Uh, never again interfere with the uniform natural laws of creation until the second coming of Christ when he will, won't he? Because at the second coming of Christ, in that event period, the earth is going to be renovated by what? By fire, not by water. <clears throat> so the second coming is going to be very important. Um, when you read Genesis 1, and I, when you read the creation story, it, 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 there's a, verse 1, and then you got tohu wabohu in verse 2. Then in verse 3, you have the restoration of creation. Uh, verse 1, is re, we have a restoration of creation. And what's interesting is Ba-Ra. Ba-Ra is used in verse 1. It is used again in verse 21 and 27. Even in your Bible, it's going to have the word create. God created. That's Ba-Ra. Other times, he's going to say God, and during creation now, it's going to say Asa. It's going to say he made. He speaks, he saw, and he made. But you pay attention to Ba-Ra because Ba-Ra means that he created something out of non-existing material, only out of himself. Ba-Ra. He does it in verse 1, 20, 21, and 27. This is really important. Then Asa is the other word in the Hebrew. It's the word for make. And that's in verse 7, 16, 25, 26, and verse 31. It's just important. So you, you know what, what would be a wonderful, and, and I, th I think I've got the New American Standard, but I think you can see this, the difference in the creation story. I think you can see the difference. I think probably all the Bibles in English translation are going to make a distinction between create, God created, and God made. When it says, asa means to make something out of something already in existence. And these are really key words. These are really good. So you ought to pay attention to every time it says in the restoration of creation, you ought to pay attention to verse 21, 20, 20 what, 7? You ought to pay attention to that. What days are those on and what did he do? Wouldn't that be important? Well, hang on because in July we're going to talk about this stuff. But here's point number two. In point number two, us two more never agains. And then he wraps it up as I, I read in my introduction. In today's lesson, we will study a fourth and a fifth never again doctrine, doctrinal principles, which should be enormously important to you and I because this is a promise from God to our world that we live in. And I don't care where you live. I don't care if you live in the other parts of the earth. Th this promise is, 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 is to the earth and those who live on it. Planet Earth and those who live on it. That, that's, that's kind of interesting. It's because we're, we're going everywhere today. We're going to outer space, inner space, uh, whatever kind of space you got, we're in it. So here's what he says in verse 11 of chapter 9, I will, uh, in the fourth and fifth. He says, I establish my covenant with you. All flesh will never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. So you wrap all these, you watch for these. Listen, this is something God said to himself, right? Within his omniscience and sovereignty. And then he spoke it out and put it on paper for you and I. And the, the, as we, my grandfather, he said, this is what you can take to the bank. <laughs> This is the stuff. This, this you don't spend on yourself. You take this to the bank. 
so we're told that he would never again cut off, cut all flesh off by flood water and never destroy the earth. That, that's planet earth by water. These five never agains are, are promises that are made as doctrinal principles to us in the post diluvian civilization. They were given as a covenant after they left the ark. That's why it's the post diluvian period. Point number three. Noah's covenant involved five parties. And that's important to you and I. That extends in the post diluvian period to the second coming of Christ. Okay? Now on Sunday, we're doing a study on that. We're talking about out of 1 Thessalonians 4 in our study book on Sunday, we're talking about the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church, and we'll talk about it Sunday, there, there's an interesting Greek word that, that, that uh, Paul used in 1 Thessalonians 4. He used two Greek words to describe the rapture of the church. We studied the first word last week, last Sunday, harpazo. But he uses another word in there, uh, parousia, parousia. Parousia is where the theology of the whole, it refers to the event of the second coming of Christ. The rapture is the first phase of it, the rapture. And so when he uses parousia, par, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, parousia, when he uses that, he uses it as the whole event. In other words, Christ comes, the church goes. Then you have the tribulation, you know, our, 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 the whole Armageddon. Then you have the millennial period, all of that in the second coming. Harpazo that was used, being caught up, is, is, the, is the first stage of the parousia. Do you, are you with me? So Sunday, we're going to talk about the parousia. He uses that word. Actually, he uses that word more in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. than he uses the word that became the name for rapture. You know, that's a Latin word for parousio, right? That's a Latin word. And it got caught up in, it's a Latin word, got caught up into theology. And we call it rapture. That's fine. I don't care. But he, in that same passage, he uses parousia. He uses, he, he uses that as reference four or five times. I, I think four times. Well, anyhow, these five nevers again. Now, we're talking about the five parties. Of course, there's God, creator of the heavens and the earth and everything they contain, right? Je that's Genesis chapters one through five. You got Noah and his family. They're, they were the believers out of the end. You know, look, look, at as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Only, listen, Noah and his wife, three sons and their wife. That's all that got out. They're the only ones willing to believe. He was a preacher of righteousness. You know, in 2 Peter 2, 5, he was a preacher of righteousness. The only people that got saved his family. Now, God bless him. He got his family. Where, where are the other kin people? Where are the rest of the Sethites? Where are the rest of the people that went to church and never believed? Right? Where are all those people? <laughs> Didn't believe. You got to believe. They, what, what, what did they have to believe? Galatians 3, they had to believe that one day Christ would come, die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead the third day. It was under a shadow of Christology. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. <laughs> No more, you know, you don't have to sacrifice your animals anymore. The Lamb of God sacrificed for the sins of the world. My, my, my. And, and they had to believe that not only did he die on a cross, but he was buried in the third day, raised from the dead. Couldn't get on no ark without it. When Christ comes back, you'll be left. Listen, I, I say that with sadness. I say that with gladness. I say it with sadness. You got to believe that. You know, Romans 1 16, the gospel. That he died for your sins, buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. You got to believe that. That is the gospel. And the gospel is the power of the salvation of everyone who believes. You can't just believe anything you want to believe. My, my, my.
Jesus was a real person. Listen, I thought it was a swear word. I was 21 years old before I realized, came to realize that Jesus was a, a, a really a historical real person. I was told when I grew up not to say Jesus Christ, it was a swear word. You know? Ah, well. I, I, listen, I had good people. They just thought that was a swear word. <laughs> Explained it to me. I didn't swear words, so I didn't say it around adults, right? You don't say a swear, swear word. Somebody's going to slap you. <laughs> you know, you say it to your friends who aren't going to slap you or beat them up. No one is family, right? Animal kingdom. Omaha, now that they, they didn't have a jump on us. Omaha wouldn't have a story if it wasn't for Noah and the ark, right? All that Omaha stuff. Well, they come off the ark. The antediluvian civilization, Genesis 5 through 8. Listen, you know what got off the boat? A Sethite. That was the first phase of the Gentile age. Adam to Noah. Genesis 5 gives the genealogy. When they get off of it, it's no one is three. They're all Sethites. One of those is going to carry, one of those sons is going to become the second phase of the Gentile age, Seth. Right? Sham. 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 The Shamites. It's going to go to the Shamites. We'll see that before we get out of chapter 9. But it goes to them. And, and that's, going to, that's going to carry the Gentile age. The second phase of the Gentile age is in the post-Diluvian period of which we live. And that's going to be carried to Abraham, and a new race is going to come. The Jewish race, the Jewish age, and with it comes the Jewish age, and then we come to the church age. Well, I'm... The post-Diluvian period takes from Genesis 9, after they get out of the ark, takes them from Genesis 9 to Revelation 20. To Revelation 20. And we're going to see the last phase of the Gentile age, we're going to see the Jewish age, church age, and millennial age, as far as dispensations. That's going to run us all the way to white throne judgment. Right? Revelation 20. Now, on your, on your second page, here's a good thing about a covenant that God makes. There's two parts, that, and Noah's covenant has it. It's got to be unconditional and everlasting. Unconditional and everlasting. And Noah's covenant has it because God made it. Remember, he kept calling the Noah's covenant, he kept calling it my covenant with you. My covenant with you. As an unconditional covenant, fulfillment of the Noah's covenant depended on the character of God and not upon the character of man. Listen, they just came out of a civilization where it was based on the character of man, and it was Listen, it all destroyed because it was evil. And so he, said, he puts it, I will, because here's what we've all learned. Where does the evil come from? Yeah, it comes from the devil. If you write devil out and mark the first letter off, that's where it comes from. Evil comes from the devil. I mean, that's the arch enemy. That's, the, that's what happened with Tohu Wabohu between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Fall of Satan. Well, we'll learn all that. It's an unconditional covenant. It depends on the character. Unconditional covenants depend on the character of the one who establishes it. For example, an unconditional covenant depends upon the, the one characteristic of God that's really important, veracity. When you put the character of God, is veracity. You know, there's a lot of things God is. One of the things, and one of the things that's important to us as we study the Bible as the book to live by, not just to read by, is that it's, it's a book full of truth. And it's based on the character of God, not the character of man, not even the character of the writers. It's based on the character of God. That's why it's called the Holy Scriptures. It's based on the character of God. It's an unconditional covenant, which means that it's based on the truthfulness of God. Veracity. The, all the covenants that God makes with man is based unconditionally on the truthfulness of God. 
it, you go like, well, I, I don't, well, listen, it, listen, the only thing that's left up to you to do is believe it. You don't have to rewrite it, but you do have to believe it. So it's based on the vera veracity of God or his truthfulness of God. And listen, and to the faithfulness of, of believers. You got to believe what he says. You got to believe what he says. And you got to believe it practically, not just theologically. You got to believe it practically. You, you got to hear it. You got to believe it. You got to do it. Then God shows out. Every time you, when you walk by faith, God shows out. Why? Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21 says that what God's promised, he, he is able and capable and willing to do. He, he, he loves to have you take him to the mat because he will show you he can win. I don't know why that's so hard to understand. It just That's the faith cycle. Hearing leads to believing, believing to applying, applying to seeing God show out. I mean, you're, listen, we are more than overcomers because of God and our faith. You know, 1 John 5, 4, right? Faith is what? The victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith on the truthfulness of God. You have to really believe in the character of God to believe, to believe the Bible. Well, anyhow, Titus 1, 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, what was the subject? In Titus 1, 2, what's the subject? Eternal life. Look. In the hope of eternal life. Now, the word hope don't mean I hope, I hope, I hope. This means a confident expectation in what God promised you. God Listen, God promised you eternal life. Your responsibility is, is hope. Confident expectation of what God has promised, he is able to perform, right? It ain't a hope, well, I hope I get it when I die. You got it. Your hope needs to be in the confidence. Your hope needs to be, it's the confident expectation of what God said he will do. So here's what he says. He says, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie. See, that's veracity. Who cannot lie. It is not in his character. What about the devil? He can't tell the truth. He's a liar, liar, pants on fire. I mean, he, he damn it. Listen, when he shows out, it's a big lie. Right? It's a big lie. He cannot tell the truth. Just think about that. And he's, listen, everybody in the Andalusian world, he had hoodwinked. That's why they drowned. That's why they died without hope. My, my, my. Isn't that terrible? Listen, you know where eternal life is? It's in a person. It's not in doing. It's in believing. 1 John 5, 11 through 13, you know what it says? What does it say? It says, eternal life is in Jesus Christ. He who has Jesus Christ has eternal life. There it is. Eternal life. Here's another way. John 14, 6. People, people all the time miss it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, right? I am the way, the truth, and life. The truth is life is a person. It's a person. It's not, it's not something. It's a person. I am the way. Every time he made a big emphasis on I am, everybody picked up stones to get him. Because they knew the Old Testament about I am that I am. And he says it in John 8, 58. He says, I am that I am. And they went, Pfft. everybody get a rock. We're going to have a rock concert tonight. That's what their idea was. Well, anyhow, these five never agains are examples of the unconditional and everlasting pro what was called promises long ages ago in that Titus 1 2 in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ago that's long ago in it we live in a post-diluvian period long ago there it is